Uh, welcome to Fusionity Talks, a student-led webinar on fusion science and engineering physics. And our speaker today is Johanna Flips from Belgium uh, on the topic of uh, 2D robotic control of a plasma probe at uh, CJK Storator. So please, uh, the audience, could you mute your microphones? Uh, and uh, Johannes, uh, if you could give a brief introduction of your background and um, activities uh, you have been working on, uh, and briefly introduce yourself, uh, that would be great. Yes, uh, thank you for uh, hosting this talk to start with. And uh, so, as said, my name is Johannes Lips. I'm originally from Belgium. My bachelor was also at the University of Ghent. Um, then last year, for my first year of the, this master program, I was in Stuttgart, and this year I'm in the Université de Lorraine in Nancy. Um, my thesis, uh, on which I will be working, I'm already starting a bit, uh, but next semester mainly I will be working on this, is on uh, antenna design for, for multi-reflectometry purposes, so for diagnostics. And today I will talk to you about uh, the 2D robotic control of a plasma probe, which is a project that I worked on uh, last year I, when I was in Stuttgart. I was uh, employed for 10 hours a week from October to July by the plasma uh, group um, to basically upgrade a system that they already have since uh, 2000, more or less, um, which is a, um, well, to the robotic control of a plasma probe. And um, I suggest we get started with um, ha having a look at uh, the, the file. Just a quick note, which is, uh, 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 please, uh, the audience, feel free to ask questions throughout the talk, uh, because we try to make it as an open discussion. Uh, and don't wait till the very end uh, if you need to clarify something. Sorry. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, if you would have any questions in between, then uh, just ask. There's no problem in interrupting. Um, thank you for adding that. Um, but oh, at the University of Stuttgart, um, and it uh, got started in. And CMAT, which was at the time not even called CMAT, as uh, this TJI, then it was upgraded TJI U, and then TJK from Kiel because it was moved to Germany to Kiel. Uh, CMAT is in Spain for those that don't know that. Um, and we see so here in the middle that um, this is a um, stellarator, but not a classical stellarator because we also have toroidal field coils, we don't just have helical coils. And uh, uh, torsatron um, has this combination of toroidal uh, and helical field coils because the helical coils are not like um, in a normal stellarator having currents in two directions, but just in one direction. And uh, this one is um, what they currently have in, uh, in CMAT, which is um, TJ2. Um, where you can see that this structure becomes even more complicated. So this is also a torsatron, but uh, here you have some sort of modular helical uh, coils which are um, separated in different parts. And again, these toroidal coils, which are typical for torsatrons, but not for a uh, normal stellarator. Also on um, this picture, we can, on this series of pictures, we can of course see that, well, the device becomes more and more complicated as with most fusion devices. Um, they are upgraded through time uh, to have more uh, functionality on uh, uh, the middle, what or the basis remains, of course, with this device. So in the helical coil, we have some cooling channels here. Uh, that's um, the copper we can see here. It's still present here. It's a bit more difficult to see, but what's uh, new, for example, what they are building now in Stuttgart is a gyrotron, uh, more or less next to where this picture was taken to provide extra heating on a, on a different frequency. Uh, we also see some heating here, uh, microwave heating, all the heating is microwave heating for TJK. The device that we will be focusing on today is, is this device with the 2D uh, light probe controller, which we can see here from a different perspective. And um, it can, of course, move in two dimensions. That is the essence of this device. And inside will be a Langmuir probe mounted like 
these Langmuir probes. Using the Langmuir probes, we will apply voltages to the different probe tips. We will measure the currents which flow through it. And that way we get a current voltage characteristic from which we can get the density and temperature of the plasma. Um, it is, of course, very interesting that we can move it in two directions because that allows us to do uh, sweeps. Um, so we can get characteristics, uh, for example, along a certain line or a certain section of uh, the plasma. And um, it is a very interesting device, which is in, for the plasma group at the University of Stuttgart, crucial for their research. Um, we will have now a closer look at what actually makes the movement, because that is very important for this device. So the section which is marked here in red is um, one uh, linear movement component in the Z direction in this case, which um, we see again here. Here we have exactly the same structure. So this is not the same device as you can see. It is a 1D control. And uh, this can also be mounted here at the same port. Uh, and then you would just have one uh, direction that the probe can move. Um, the advantage of having a look at this is that it, uh, well, for me, it allowed me, while I was upgrading, to test the device with uh, two of these um, 1D um, manipulators connected to my computer instead of a chunky uh, 2D manipulator. And the working is exactly the same. You have water, which means that you can control the step size very precisely. You can send a signal to this motor turned by 0 0.01 uh, degree, and it will do exactly that. It has a, um, a feedback loop to make sure that it will um, do exactly this. Um, this motor will turn, and it's connected to this rod, which is this rod, which will also turn, and then this functions as a war wheel, which will then make this plate uh, have a linear movement downwards or upwards, and uh, that will also then move the probe, which is mounted in this uh, vacuum compatible tube. The yellow is just um, for protection, so you can ignore that. Also, we can see that there are multiple switches, there are two on top upwards, and there's a vacuum compatible tube. The yellow is just um, for protection, so you can ignore that. Also, we can see two limiting switches and one reference switch, and you can see to the plate and push on these switches so that they can be activated. Uh, and that's basically it. That's that's how this works. Are there any questions on that? Uh, on the working of this um, manipulators? Uh, may I ask, may, may I ask that uh, first, what is the precision uh, with which you can uh, position uh, the probe? Um, I do not know exact precision of the probe. I know that uh, the motor can move with a precision of um, 0 0.01 radians. And I mm -hmm. think that the conversion, because it is, of course, important to know then, if you know how precise this motor can move, what the conversion is between uh, this 0 0.01 radian to the linear movement here. But it is definitely more accurate than uh, 0 0.1 millimeter because we did tests with that. Uh, well, I did tests with that and that worked. So it's definitely more accurate. So I would say tens of millimeters, but it's, it's I'm not sure. But, um, it's not, I, I never used the device in research. I was just um, responsible for upgrading the system, but um, I can ask definitely someone who's doing research with this and uh, get back to you later if you would be interested. Um, yeah, thank you for the reply. Uh, the main part is, of course, that you have this motor and then afterwards this blue part is a conversion box, which um, actually makes it even more precise because you would have um, here this box meaning that you can have, if you have a certain step here, it can be a smaller step there. Um, basically, this gearbox will give them the, the decision also that you can have afterwards. If this gearbox makes it that a very small step of the motor is translated in a very big step of the rod, 
then of course your precision will be lower than if you get from a small step of the motor to an even smaller step of the rod and, um, and that way also movement will be smaller. So you can regulate your precision by changing this blue gearbox, it's called, it's just a couple of, of gears, so of wheels with teeth that um, can change the ratio of one turn here to one turn of the rod. And uh, so you can, by changing this, and it's not too clear here because we can only see one. I don't know if we can see here. But here there is actually a different system used for the conversion. This one is with the blue belt with the same function. And again, you can get a higher precision. Um, to upgrade the system. Could you repeat that again? Well, could you repeat that again? The last here for a while. Okay. So the essence is that you can upgrade the system. Then. So the essence by changing the air box. So by changing the ratio of one turn of motor, one turn of the rod of the one wheel. And here, for example, in the two B device, the um, Transmission is done with a different type. It's not clear in this picture at all. But you can see that there's no blue box <laughs> because there is no blue box here, a different type of transmission, which also means that uh, the accuracy of this rod translating can be different of the accuracy of this rod translating, which can be different from the one at the big one at the back, which is actually different mm -hmm. um, from the one at the back. Um, um, yeah. Yeah, Johannes. Yes. Yes. So I have one doubt on this slide, like the slide you are talking so, about. Like now I'm actually seeing the slide with hardware software. Okay. So in this slide, I have one doubt. So we have actually uh, two, like robotic control, like for moving in the vertical direction and mm -hmm. horizontal direction. Yes. yes. And both are connected to the Langmuir probe. So, for example, if the vertical Let's say it's working and it's trying to move the Langme probe up. Yes. And then how mm -hmm. these two systems are attached? The horizontal one will be attached. I don't know where is the attachment point for this two systems. So in in this uh, specific case, so with with the uh, with the two separate ones, you mean, right? Not with the one. So you're not talking about the two device that we have here, right? This is clear. The the two dimensional. Yeah, so the, these two uh, controls are attached to a single Langmuir probe, right? So, um, yes, so this one will control this axis, and this one controls this axis, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they're not both connected directly to the Langmuir probe. What's happening is actually that um, inside here, you have um, some sort of grid. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I don't have a picture with this open, of course, because it's in the vacuum and it's not that easy to open it. But mm -hmm. um, you would have a grid in which there are there's a part which is on which the Langmuir probe is mounted, which is not directly either of the axes. So you have somewhere here a little square on which the Langmuir probe would be mounted, and the square will be mounted on one axis, like here. Uh, on one axis on the z direction, one on the x direction, and these two can be mounted. So the axis on the along the x direction will be movable in the z direction, and the axis along the z direction will be movable along the x direction. And that oh, way, okay. this little square which is mounted. Do do you understand or? Yeah, yeah I, can, I, can, I can understand. I can understand. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so, so that's basically how it works. Indeed, it, they're not mounted directly to the language probe. That's true. Mm -hmm. okay, uh, okay, cool. Okay. And here, in, the, in this one, you basically have just a 1D control. But for testing, what I did was I connected both of them to my computer. And I just, well, the computer doesn't know, obviously, if this is really a 2D control or just two 1D controls. And then the, it would just do two movements in the Z direction on my, on my desk but it would be enough for me to actually be able to simulate the behavior of one X and one Z direction. Um, but these are just separate systems. Um, these are not connected in any way normally. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the questions. Yeah. 
So let's move on uh, to this slide, uh, which is basically the, the schedule on upgrading something. And um, this is the, the hierarchy we can see here of um, the different components that are necessary to make a diagnostic device like this work. To start with, it's important to know that the system that um, I upgraded was running on Windows XP, which is uh, a bit of a shame because it's no longer supported by Windows. You have a higher risk on viruses, and mainly when it crashes, it's done. You cannot just buy new license codes for Windows XP. So um, it would not be good if this happened. And uh, therefore, what you want is, of course, to, be able to upgrade Windows XP to something new. However, uh, to be able to do that, you need to have also a compatible version of LabVIEW. LabVIEW is a programming language in which this um, probe system is programmed. And the LabVIEW version that was used um, was LabVIEW 8.2, which is from 2007. And um, the problem is that if you want to upgrade Windows, you need to have a LabVIEW version which is compatible with the newer version of Windows, and it's not the case with LabVIEW 8.2. However, to update this LabVIEW version, because that implies obviously that we also need to update the LabVIEW version to something newer, we need to change the software which is used in LabVIEW, some functions which are necessary to control the motors, um, are also using old software which is again not compatible with the new version of LabVIEW. So uh, we need to have new software, but this new software turned out to be not compatible with the old hardware used. And this old hardware is um, the driver card. And uh, a driver is basically the, the step in between what you actually want in between your device, in between something that moves or something that does measurements and your computer. So you can plug here, you can plug the, the device into it. Uh, this can be any sorts of ports, uh, just data buses. And here you plug this into one of the slots in your desktop. And um, the reason that you need drivers is that you, when you send signals, because your computer will just send signals, they might not be the right voltage to um, be able to actually get something done for, from, for example, the servo motor, as we saw on the previous slide. What you need is something that converts these simple digital signals to actual signals that can be used um, by the device. Uh, if you send just a nice string of, of zeros and ones to a servo motor, it will not do the step that you asked it to do. And likewise, when it sends you its feedback signal, uh, the computer does not, not know how to interpret this. this. This is basically the interpreter of the whole circuit. And um, what does needed to be done was to change the hardware, to change this driver to a new driver, um, both are from physical instruments, so both will be compatible also with these motors that we saw on the previous slide from physical instruments, which is just a company. This new driver comes with new software which can be used in new LabVIEW, which can be used in a new Windows version. Um, and therefore, it was necessary to change all of this in this hierarchy order. So if you want to change the upper layer, you also need to change all the downward layers to make sure everything is compatible. Um, and then there was the same problem actually for the data acquisition part, a bit different. Um, because here there was just one change to be made, and it was that um, LabVIEW, all, the old LabVIEW version used to work with what's called NI National Instruments, which is the company that provides LabVIEW DAC, data acquisition. And this was changed to NI DAC MX in 2004. And this software, these functions that are necessary for the data acquisition, and are normally used in LabVIEW, uh, in the old version of LabVIEW, can no longer be used in the new versions of LabVIEW. So all these functions also needed to be changed to uh, NI DAC MX. Um, are there any questions about this? I think maybe it's not that easy to understand um, because, I mean, it's of course clear that 
you need to understand you need to upgrade all the steps but i don't know if i was clear with my explanation yeah. of the driver yeah can you tell about the hardware like what's the purpose of the hardware it, it yes. receives like it sends yes. output to the control system and receives input from the computer is it right or exactly in both directions actually this is, is some sort of interface which um changes so it's also it's two times a, a different hardware right here we have on on the motor control part we have the motor drivers which uh, send and receive signals from the motors and send and receive signals to the computer but it's basically these drivers make sure that the the, the systems can use their own um their own uh, necessary strengths like you need you need to have a certain voltage, for example, for for um, these motors to operate, right? These uh, these motors need to be under I don't know, for example, five volts the entire time to be able to operate. If you would just connect directly your motor with your computer, there wouldn't be a five volt signal being able to get sent through uh, one of the one of these cables, one of the one of the ports of um, of these buses. Um, and therefore you need the driver which which does the conversion between them and then for the um, data acquisition part so that's what you get from the langmuir probes it's exactly the same you also need to provide of course for a langmuir probe you need to provide a certain voltage to the to the probe so you you want this to be done on the one side but on the other side you don't want your computer to give this voltage and therefore you have this card which which does the conversion which makes sure that your computer signals are um, processed uh, or yeah processed in the correct way by your uh, components that then you you use for the actual movement or for the actual data acquisition so these drivers are basically conversion cards uh, and they can be used for for tons of things um, does that answer the question? Yeah, it, yeah. Okay. So actually next part is a bit more about these drivers. So here you see a couple of cards. I mean, they're not necessarily all what you would call a driver, but um, in the end, the function of, of cards like this is always the same. You get a certain input, like here it's USB. Uh, this can also be, for example, uh, inputs that you get from data acquisition. A lot of modern data acquisition devices actually run through USB. It's not because it's a USB port that you can plug in a USB stick. Um, and, uh, or you can have weird connections like here or here. And then you see that uh, this is the, the connection that you would make with your external device. And this are the connections that you would make inside in your desktop with ports which look like this. Um, and the ports that we needed also in the new computer were the ports in which we can plug in the data acquisition card. Because for the um, motor control part, you can see that we have a little separate unit, which uh, does no longer need to be plugged in in one of these slots, but is just connected through USB actually. However, for the data acquisition, we did need a certain slot. And that was a PCI slot. And, um, a mistake that we made, me and my supervisor, was that we uh, mistook a PCIe slot, which was present in the computer I was working on, for a PCI slot, which was not present. Uh, therefore, we, in the end, weren't able to plug in our data acquisition card, and we actually spent a couple of, well, a couple of days um, trying to change or to make a conversion, maybe, but then we need to be careful because if you do a conversion from a PCIe to a PCI, might also have um, then that uh, the voltages that you need cannot be supplied over this conversion unit. Uh, so that was a bit of a mess. In the end, we just ended up um, taking all the software that I, I programmed to another Windows 10 computer and then just run it from there. Um, but uh, the main thing here is that it's important that you have compatibility of all steps. And this is crucial for well any system to work of course but if you're upgrading it's something that is easy to lose track of it's um well it's not just the windows that needs to be compatible with the lab view for which you get these 
nice tables provided by lab here. It's not just the, the software and the hardware that needs to be, to be compatible with the hardware that needs to be compatible with Windows, uh, the hardware that needs to be compatible with actual computer, which would be over here, right? And that's this, this system of, um, of input buses that you, that you get in the desktop. The software that needs to be compatible with Windows, maybe some functions provided by the manufacturer don't run on a certain Windows version. Um, everything needs to be compatible with each other. So this is really crucial. And uh, it's also something that when you upgrade a system, you need to take into account that you, before you actually get started, you, well, of course, you need to understand what you're doing. And then you need to make sure that you get all the compatibility tables and you make sure that you have one place where you can say, okay, over here, this is compatible with this, this is compatible with this, this is compatible with this, and everything just matches. Um, can I proceed, or are there any questions? The next part is, um, is about LabVIEW, uh, but uh, if there are any questions about, this is the big break, uh, everything before was more general, everything later will become uh, very focused on LabVIEW. So um, if there are still any questions about um, drivers or about uh, anything else that I mentioned, then please let me know. Okay, then I will move on. Um, LabVIEW then. LabVIEW is the program, uh, programming language in which all of this is happening. And um, this is the interface of uh, the measurement system and it's updated in 2019. Uh, here's a little proof that I did this. Um, and that you can see also that the original program was well written some time ago. It's very nice that you have this um, nice interface uh, with uh, boxes and um, input parameters and then output graphs. And the very nice thing of LabVIEW is that you don't have to worry about this at all. LabVIEW automatically provides everything you need to make this because it automatically will make a graphical interface when you create some functions. Uh, we will dive into that deeper uh, later on uh, when I will have a small demonstration of LabVIEW. And um, this is the front panel and it's, well, everything that looks like this is LabVIEW. Uh, you will always get this uh, gray background. Uh, you will have these arrows on the top for starting, stopping. You can eliminate this, but most of the time people don't. And um, there is, however, also the backside of this, and this is the block diagram. So here we had the front panel and then the other, uh, panel is the block diagram and this looks like this and this still looks okay but uh, this is all you get this is your programming language LabVIEW is a visual programming language unlike most other languages um, and that means that you program by clicking and making blocks and connecting lines it has some parallel to be drawn with um, electric circuits you can just have some input and then uh, it will be processed and then you have some output and then it passes on to the next function and it really works or you can imagine it at least as some sort of analog system in which you just have a couple of boxes and you connect them and there's a signal sent through. Um, it's nice uh, and easy to begin with. That's a, a big advantage of the system because, um, well, for example, Lego Mindstorms, the, the robot of, of Lego also works with this block diagram system where you just have some blocks and you connect them and something happens. If you want to make big programs, it gets complicated very, very soon. Um, this is, I think, the best point to switch and have a look at um, a small demonstration of LabVIEW before we continue. Uh, I will just minimize this and this and this. Uh, can you, can someone confirm that you can now see um, a left view to yes. empty windows? To empty windows okay. is you. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, left view will give these two windows like we had before, the front window over here, the front panel and the block diagram. And 
in the block diagram is where the coding happens. So when you right click, you just get some functions and then you can, for example, say, okay, we're gonna have an addition done. You just put it there and then you see, okay, you have some inputs, some outputs. And um, then you can, by right clicking on the X, you can say, okay, I want to create a control for X. And then you see that the moment you did this, it shows up here. So this is what I was telling you about earlier. The graphical user interface is automatically created, which is great. You can do the same for the Y, also create a control. And then for the X plus Y, we create an indicator. And then you see that you have X, Y, X plus Y. And when we run this, we can say, okay, we add five plus two. And then it's seven. The reason it's going slow, and that's a bit annoying because I forgot to switch it off, that I had this lamp here on, um, which I will discuss very soon. However, if we would now just click here, three, four, five plus five is 10, it changes instantaneously. And that is exactly the strength of, uh, well, it's one of the strengths of lab view that you can do very quickly things like this and you see directly the result. It also allows for a very fast testing of what you just programmed because you can always, also in, in small sub functions that you program, you always will have this um, graphical interface, not only for the main program, but also for small programs that you make. And um, then you can, of course, well, make, oh, make longer programs. Like we can uh, then say, okay, we'll multiply this by another number and let's say that we make constant for this instead of for an um, instead of a control and then we connect the input uh, here with the output from the previous operation and then we can again create an indicator for the output and it says x plus y well it's not actually x plus y uh, x times y rather it is X plus Y, uh, X plus Y times six. And it's also nice that you can name your variables because this is the name of this indicator and you can just name it X plus Y times six. And then when we practice, you can see that it works perfectly. Um, next thing to have a look at would be probably some structures. Structures are things like loops. Uh, case structures, sequences, or um, if structure, that's the boolean, no, did I miss it? Ah, case structure, yes, okay. So this, if you have a simple case structure, it would be a true or false, of course. Um, then if we would run this program, you see that it's not able to run it because if we have a look, the case structure has no selector. So we need to make sure that we have um, something that says in which case we are. So we can create a switch and then you see that there's a switch over here and you can press it and you can see that, okay, if it's true, this will be executed. If it's false, nothing will be executed. So if it's true, the addition will be executed. If it's false, not so. For the moment, this is false, so nothing is happening. As we put this on, it changes directly. And that is the, the essence of LabVIEW, maybe. Um, that you just drag and drop things, and you connect them, and that's it. Then you can make this um, a program. And then maybe that's also interesting to demonstrate. So I'm just going to drag this out here. And I'm going to delete this and we're back to this uh, basic program. And what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to save this as AVI. Um, I'm going to save it as untitled one VI. That's fine with me. OK. And then I'm going to open a new VI. VI is just a name for a program. And we're going to do something different. We're going to open. So when we are opening here, uh, a function like we did before. Instead of taking the functions which are listed here, 
we will take this program that we just wrote entitled one. And then you see that here is a little cube and it doesn't do anything. And if we click on this, then we get back here. And if we want to use this program, because until now it is a program, if we want to use this as a function in a different program, in program two, which we have here, then what we need to do is we need to say, we need to define some inputs and outputs. We of course know that these are the inputs and this is the output. However, the program itself doesn't know that yet. So what we can do is we can have here where we see the same icon as we have here, and we can connect some terminals. We can say, okay, this terminal will be X. This terminal will be y and then on the other side this terminal will be x plus y times six and then if we save this what we just did is we turned this program into a function it can still be used as a separate program you can still run this and this still works but the advantage is that here now you can see that we have terminals on this cube Meaning that we can also do exactly what we just did before. We can create, maybe let's take some constants here instead of controls. Um, and then an indicator. And then we see that here we have the indicator of this little program. And, it, and you can see it's way more, well, it's already smaller, even though it was a very simple function. And then we can maybe say, okay, we want to add two and one and multiply it by six. We run it. And then here we see that this is 18. And that is, I think, really the essence of, um, of LabVIEW, that you can have programs simultaneously be programs and functions, allowing you to test them. Because we just made it here. We were able to test everything here. And then we directly go to a higher level and uh, we go here and we use this as a function not no longer as a program and we can just use it exactly as we did before and um, yeah that's i think lab view in a nutshell um, then there's this little lamp which is uh, the error um, well or the execution analyzer uh, it's what you would normally do if you are um, debugging your code you would look at it step for step and this is also quite nice to do here because if you highlight this what you will see is that there will be dots moving along the lines really like signals moving and they will get to this cube and then they will be preceded here and then they will get back here and you will have some output here so if we execute this now you see two dots move there then dots are moving here then dots move back here and then it executes and that's also very useful when executing also that you can also um, add probes just as if you would have an analog system. You can go to tools, or view, sorry, view uh, tools palette, and you can say, okay, I want to probe whatever comes through this wire. And now when it gets executed, so this is probe number one, you will see, you will see that the value passed through it is two. And then you can also add a probe here. And then you can see that the value passed through this is, wait for it, okay, 18. And that way you get um, a very nice um, uh, direct, uh, well, mean of controlling your code, of testing your code before you use it, and of, uh, and well, of, of using uh, LabVIEW as a programming language, which is very intuitive, but gets a bit tricky when you make more complicated things. Last thing I want to show before we return to the presentation is uh, here you can have the VI hierarchy. And it's quite simple here. You um, have well, basically what this is is a linear structure is telling you what you call in which program. Um, if you would have a look at uh, program one, then you see that it's at the very bottom. You don't call any other programs in this program. However, in program two, we do call a program, namely program one, because, well, it's over here. We can, uh, just let me get back here. 
Okay, we can, for example, if we would add this and we would put it here, no, if we would delete it rather, then we will see that here it also gets deleted and we have actually now two separate um, programs which are not interconnected. But this is very interesting, this hierarchy, because then you can have multiple levels and you can have a nice view of how your um, BIs, how your programs are interconnected. Um, it is, I think, a very interesting thing, LabVIEW. It's totally different than what most programming languages are like, but it is very useful for, um, for purposes like this, for in laboratory environments. Um, are there any questions on what I just explained? I, I, I was just curious um, how large the program can become and how easy or difficult it is to handle uh, that would be a huge code in MATLAB and let's say how would it look like in LabVIEW if it's very yes. very I will I will come to that uh, in just a second um, so maybe I can jump ahead even and show you it now directly what we just saw was this very simple hierarchy, right? Uh, with just one, two, three steps connected. And then here you can see already, well, this is the via hierarchy of the um, program that I was working. And you see that already you call, okay, some functions here that you call here, these are actually uh, global variables, which, uh, so they're not really function, but then here you see that the functions begin. Here there's a bunch of functions, here there's a bunch of functions. You see that the levels, well, it's really um, on levels. So you have one function which calls five, which calls 10, which calls, and so on. So the more, the deeper you would go, the more levels you would have. And also what is annoying uh, and means that you need a lot of screens is also that you need to open them in separate windows. You cannot just have code running one below the other. You always have a window on top of a window on top of a window. That's a bit annoying. Um, but to answer your question, how many uh, levels, how many um, functions you can have instead of a big chunk of MATLAB code, well, you get something like this, and then you get something like this. And that is, I think, the best representation of what a big lab view program looks like. And it is not that clear. It is just a bunch of lines. And this is really the best representation you can get in this VI hierarchy um, viewer. And the blue lines are all the ones which are directly connected with the main application, or with, uh, I think, with the second layer here. And um, this is what you need when you want to update the system as well, because suppose that um, all the data acquisition part, which needed to be changed, would be somewhere over here, uh, would be this cube, which is responsible for what well, would probably be some levels up would be this cube which is responsible for all the data acquisition within the main program and you would have to take a look at let me get back to this laser pointer and you would have to have a look at all the levels or all the things that it is connected with on lower levels and see okay i need to change this main cube because it doesn't work anymore in the new lab view environment because i uh, have incompatible functions on lower levels. Basically, that's what it would be. And um, you would have to have a look at the main cube that you need to update. You would have to have a look at the lower levels, at the lower levels, at the lower levels, at the lower levels. You would need to understand all of these in the old system before you can get to change it to the new system. And that's what, uh, well, it's a very nice programming language to program in, but it's a very annoying language to update because you need to, well, you cannot just run through your code and say, oh, this function is not compatible, I can change it by this function. You need to open new windows and new windows and new windows and double click on everything. And then every time you open a new program, you don't just get the blog diagram, you also get this front panel, which you actually don't want, but it, it's a mess on your, on your screen. It's always a mess on your screen. Um, so that's, I think, uh, a response to how complicated things can get. Uh, within LabVIEW, and they get complicated very soon. Um, there is one more thing that I would like to tell you about in LabVIEW, which is the reason, or the, one, one of the main reasons why it's really commonly used in laboratories, it's uh, this error variable. So as you saw before, this is just a variable like the ones that we had. We had orange variables, which are 
um, numeric variables. Green ones are booleans. Um, purple ones are actually clusters or arrays, so combinations of variables. And uh, this one also has a different wire, which also means that it's a cluster. But um, it uh, is the error variable. It's a very interesting one, and you will see it in every code. It's always this, this well, yellowish brown. And uh, what this does is it precedes the error uh, within the code, and it makes it quite easy to do error handling. Of course, for fusion applications, for example, for this probe, it's very, uh, why it's crucial that you have a vacuum. For this probe, that means that this moving components are always sucked inwards if you wouldn't keep them from being sucked inwards. So your motors would always need to maintain their position so that there's no way that it can be sucked inwards. If you would switch off the power supply to your motor, the probe would just crash into the vacuum wall, uh, into the vacuum chamber wall. So what you don't want is if there is an error occurring in your program, that the program just stops, doesn't provide power anymore to your motors, and then you have this nice crash. What you do want is that you have good error handling, that you get an error, and then you say, OK, um, I will just keep my uh, position, or I will return to reference position, depending on what the error is. And in a lot of languages, this is not that easy to do. Normally, you would have to well write a lot of code to do your error handling. In LabVIEW, it's very easy to do that because you just create an error variable, which is a standard variable, and you can just proceed it through your code. And that also means that well, code cannot be executed before all the variables arrive. So if you have your error propagation, you can also define some sequencing in your code. You can always uh, determine how the code will be executed just by following this line. So you start here, you go here, you go here, we go here. This is how this code will be executed. And um, we see here that, uh, for example, we initialize. Uh, this is part of the moving. Um, so we initialize it. Then we will um, close. I think it's closing the, the, the previous session, if that would be necessary. Um, then append lock is just adding some information to your logbook. Then here you will do a manual movement of the probe, maybe to reference position, and you will also check if you encountered an error. Then you will move, um, well, both of these move statements are optional, and there will be well, a button like uh, just saying, okay, do we do this or not? But you have to run through it to see if you actually uh, do it or not. So this would, uh, this manual movement, would probably have a huge if statement with a button outside. And if the button is ticked, then it will be executed. If not, then this manual movement will just be an empty box just passing the signals through. And uh, then you move the probe as it's mentioned by the parameters automatically. And then, well, you just carry on the business as usual. And then you go to error out, which can then be handed to the next program. Um, the error propagation would always, uh, when this program it's not, but in this program it is, that you will always see that you have a bunch of, uh, of uh, true, false, so case statements, case structure, if structures, um, by which the error is actually the one saying if it needs to be executed or not. And that's something that you will see very often in LabVIEW is that the error will decide what is executed. It makes sense, right? If, if everything's going fine, you just execute everything. If something is the matter, you stop executing it and you do something different. So at every step, you can have an error uh, saying coming into an if block and then saying, OK, if there is no error, we just execute this. If there is an error, either we pass it on and let something else handle with this, or we act on this right away. And um, that is a big advantage of LabVIEW, in my opinion, over other uh, programs, that this error propagation is very intuitive. And it's actually necessary to, if you want to have efficient coding, you will have the error propagation involved anyway. So you will not accidentally forget about this and then cause problems to your diagnostic devices. Um, 
this we already have. And then we come to the options that we have when we um, are upgrading. And um, this is uh, something which is tricky to do. And maybe it's also not that clear when I'm going to explain it. Please interrupt me when there would be any problems in my explanation. Um, suppose that you would have this as a part of the VI hierarchy, right? So you have some different levels. You have some interconnection, meaning that this VI building block uh, would be used as a function in this one and in this one. And then these would be used in a higher level and so on and so on. And now suppose that these are the troublemakers. These are the components that are um, not compatible anymore with the new version of LabVIEW, right? So these can be programs, for example, provided by the company who made the drivers. And in case that they are uh, so not compatible with, um, Oh, so yeah. So if they if they're not compatible with with a new version, of course we need to change them with the new functions applied um, provided with the new drivers that come with the new drivers, right? So in my case, this would have been all functions which use the old drivers for the motors, and the green one would be functions that use are used by the new drivers of the motors. And this would be the the basic way of dealing with this. Suppose that these functions are changed one on one. That would be nice. Then, um, then we can just replace yellow cubes by green cubes one on one. That would be perfect. That would be not that much work. However, what is the case is that these functions do not do exactly the same. Uh, you can have here, for example, a cube which says move, um, and uh, it has the options to move left and move right, and this one has an option to move clockwise and counterclockwise. Or you can have uh, a bunch of things. This was actually a thing that the old ones uh, used to work in units um, in the, the radians, so the, the steps taken by the motors, and the new ones can also work in the linear um, way, so in, in the millimeters that are used by, um, by the probe movement. Um, so you can see that the basic option would be you stay at the same level, but the connection changes, and therefore you need to know what is going on so you need to understand all of these functions all of these functions actually the use of these functions is not that important to you anymore because you don't touch this and if you just make sure that the outputs that these cubes provide are the same then you you're fine so what you will do often is change this and then because um the arrows here are changed, the inputs of these functions are changed, that also means that you have to change this level of function. So you replace the lowest level, and then you modify the middle level so that the output of the middle level is the same, and you don't have to bother about anything which is above here. Just remember that you are probably working somewhere down here. So it's quite nice if you don't have to worry about anything going up, up here. Because these programs are the complicated ones. These ones are the more basic ones, of which there are more, of course, in, uh, in number, but their functionality is more restricted. Um, another option would be to have something like this. Um, suppose that these functions are actually the ones that the new uh, company or the new software provides are way more powerful already, then you maybe just skip this layer. Well, suppose that this would work in radians and um, you would use this function to translate it to linear movement, well, why not directly use the new one that can already work in linear movement as input for this level? Um, however, that means that you, in this case, do need to know what's going on here. And that can mean that you need a lot more time to, to do this. Um, another option would be that you have something like this, in which uh, you have some functions which are more or less the same as the ones that you had here. You see that this one and this one have the same connections with uh, the cubes above. But some functions actually work on a different level already. Maybe um, the, the new um, software provides one, functions, one function directly, which can initiate the, um, the, the motors 
and move them to the reference position in one go, just standard there for you, then you might even skip a couple of levels and maybe there could be a green cube over there. Um, so you have a bunch of options to, to deal with uh, um, or to choose from, rather. And uh, the main choice will always be that either you, you change things at the low level and you don't need to um, you don't need to understand that much of what's going on in your code, or you change things at a higher level, but you need to have more understanding of your code. And um, if you change things at, at a, a low level, maybe, maybe it is possible to skip a level, but maybe it will cost way less time to not do it, to just um, pretend that these functions can only do what these functions can do and then make more or less the same connections. Another problem which is important is not only the choice of, of the levels, but also the, um, the form of the, the type of the variables that you use. Suppose that we have again this thing where you have the linear movement of the probe or the, the circular movement of uh, the servo motor. And uh, the new uh, functions provide um, millimeters and the old ones provided radians. And uh, suppose, however, that you don't want millimeters, but you do want radians. So the new ones are actually less powerful than the old ones. It's also possible. So what you need is to convert these units so that they can be used by, by the next cube, by the next function. And there, there are also a couple of options. You can maybe do the translation of units uh, in this in this intermediate layer, because these are, are functions provided by the manufacturer, you will not have access in the block diagram there. You cannot just go and change um, what the output type is. For example, it can be as stupid as a decimal number versus a, a hexadecimal number, which are different in, in LabVIEW. Um, and what you then need to do is is then well translate it so that you can actually proceed. Another option would be to translate them at the lowest level, but again, you cannot touch this, but you can maybe say, okay, if here something exits in millimeters, then I directly uh, transform it to uh, radians. And this boat, well, these seem very plausible options. However, when you would look at this with uh, from the point of view from somebody who never saw this code before and who comes, for example, a couple of years after you've upgraded this code, both of these options would look ridiculous to this person because he knows that this is in millimeters and that in the end you want millimeters and then for some weird reason in between you're going to switch to radians. Um, doesn't seem to make any sense and this person would have right to think that. One of the options would be to avoid this this intermediate level by skipping over it but then again you need more understanding or a better option even would be to just um, well just change the whole system if the whole system used to be programmed in radians but now we can have more powerful code and we can do everything in, in meters in the linear system why not just eliminate all these references to radians we just complicate the process and it makes sense to do that. However, then again, you need to move up higher and higher in your BI hierarchy. You need to be uh, doing changes on very high levels already if you want to eliminate all the um, reference, uh, references to radians, for example. Or, um, well, there, there are a lot of, of similar uh, examples that you can think of in, in which, for example, you would have an output type provided as long and you don't want it to be long, you want it to be single, um, because everything else is built with singles, with single flow precision. And then you, uh, you would change it in the, in the very beginning. Okay, this long goes to single, but then somebody else would go, like, why, would we, why would we change everything to single precision if the basis is different? We can just work with long precision the entire time. There's no need for this. And they're absolutely right. But as an upgrader, it's not, um, it's not that you want to change everything. You just want it to work. Definitely, if you have a limited time, you don't want to go and uh, 
make the main program look very nice, which is possible. It's always possible to make it nicer and make it more effective, but you will have to spend way more time. Um, I think these were the main things that I wanted to say. If I'm not mistaken, the next yes should be my summary. Um, and maybe I'll just give my son and then afterwards we can ask questions. So the summary is, is quite simple. Um, first of all, understand all your components, uh, which, well, means play around with them. It's, uh, it means that you have to have a look at your, at your software, you have to understand your hardware, you have to understand your programming environment, you have to understand, um, well, the operating system, Windows in this case. And you need to understand, for example, in LabVIEW, how things are working. You need to understand how these motors are working. So you just play around with very basic things before you get into anything else. You check the compatibility. Um, you can do this after you understand the components, definitely after you understand the old components. Um, then you, you check the compatibility. So that's what I mentioned before. You have to make this compatibility charge, charts and make sure that the point on which you are aiming at uh, will have a, well everything will be compatible at this point um, then choose on which level you make the changes is what i was just telling you uh, before you can choose to make changes on a high level and then you will have um, well nicer program definitely but and definitely well um, it will look nicer for the programmer it might normally it will have absolutely no effect for the end user but uh, if you also if you make changes on a higher level it might be nice to upgrade it another time because if you always upgrade complicating the structures which you do if you if you do this translation things at low level um, then you will make it difficult for the future sometime there will be uh, it will be necessary to change it decently um, and then it might be very difficult then the two last ones are, well, obvious maybe, but still very important. Document your changes and mention the date of change um, so that other users know what you've been doing, provide details on what you did. Uh, for example, for me, uh, some of the functions that I changed, uh, the new ones had a built-in timer in it. The old ones had as well, but the new ones, the standard setting for the timer was longer than for the old ones. And then when people were using this for sweep measurements, this device, they would have measurements and then it wouldn't be on time for the next measurement because there was a building weight function with the too long timer so it's very important they were able to locate it quite quickly thanks to good notation and they knew exactly where i had been working and where i hadn't been working so they could look specifically to the functions that they used for this um, protocol to run and then they could look at okay where are there any possibilities for this mistake that weren't there in the in the first one in the old version um, but it's very important to provide good documentation, definitely if, if you're not the one, the only one who's operating it, but even otherwise it's, it's still important. And then test functionality in between phases, another, well, plus point of lab view, uh, as we saw, is that you have this option to test functionality, and that's also something that you should definitely do. Um, and then, well, it... Uh, Actually, uh, I was done with this upgrading um, right on time. It was, uh, I was um, employed from October to uh, the end of June, uh, I think, and June, July, some, somewhere like that. And two weeks before uh, I was supposed to finish, I finished this, and then we had this small problem um, with the uh, bus compatibility that I discussed before because we needed a PCI slot and another PCIe slot. And uh, then we were able to just in time test everything and everything turned out to work. So, um, well, it's, I think, a, a good experience for me. It was very interesting. Um, I hope that you enjoyed the talk. I hope that you learned a lot about not only um, the system specifically and LabVIEW, but also on upgrading systems in general. I think it's something that is um, very important. And also when you're writing code, it might be, Good to keep these things into in your mind, in the back of your head, so that you also know what you will be looking for later on when you would upgrade your code, so that you can make it a bit easier for yourself in another stage. Um, thank you for attending, and if there are any further questions, I would be very happy to hear them. Thank you very much for the profound introduction to the topic.
It was very interesting to learn more about LabVIEW. I haven't used it myself personally, and it was great to see uh, how it works. Uh, it was very clear and interesting. So now the floor is open for questions, and you have raise hand option under more in uh, your Zoom screen. So please feel free to ask questions now. If I if I may, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Please. Yes. Okay. So I I attended with uh, with one ear, Johannes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, try to combine a little bit of uh, different tasks, but still I, I found uh, some of the messages you gave uh, very interesting and very true as well in very different contexts. The, the fact you talk about documentation, I think is something that uh, not just in academics, but uh, I see it now as well in my company, that that if, if you don't document mm -hmm. something properly, the work you do is as good as worthless because it's it's not reproducible. Nobody knows what you have done. Uh, nobody can can make changes. Nobody can see what has been done. And yeah, it, it's the, the value cannot be overestimated. I mean, uh, yeah, that there's a reason why you need to take a lot of yes, time to write your thesis. Uh, one step is to get the results, but if you just show results and not how you got them and and the way you obtain them, in fact, uh, it's, it's very difficult to be something with it. So, so I really like this, like this remark. Yeah. Thank you. And then I also like the fact that you uh, gave a little bit of a practical uh, showcase of LabVIEW, <laughs> which is an interesting software I also worked with uh, the last years. In Ghent, actually, we, we learned to work with it. And um, if you're not used to, to programming or not such a programming expert, I think it's a nice way of uh, getting to know the, the reasoning behind programming. So, so the, the, way of, the way of thinking, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's also this, this graphical options. In, in the end, programming is, well, it's, it's, in my opinion, more the essence of programming that you're, that you're looking at. Um, because programming is not necessarily just writing codes in the end what is happening is just a sequence of logical things um, well they, they used to be analog computers before they were the digital ones which was also programming also just a sequence of things passing being passed on and then you would have capacitors and uh, and uh, coils to have non-linear effects introduced and in the end you, you just have the, the same reasoning the same uh, reasoning in the algorithm um, in both these old analog computers as in lab view graphical um, programming languages as in normal programming languages which you can well you could have uh, also human computers right where you just do something pass it on to the next person do something pass it on to the next person with instructions um, and then you could do crazy calculations like this without knowing what's going on which the, the humans would would be the, the chains of this, but in the end, the, the essence of the programming is just the, the chain of operations and not coding it on a computer. Um, it's the algorithm which is crucial, and indeed, with, with these graphical languages, I think you come to a more pure form of this in, in the sense that you, well, you get more that it is about a sequence of things happening and that the order is important. And not necessarily that you know what common to um, what uh, function to use um, in this specific language at this time. You can just say, "Oh, I need something that adds to numbers." Well, oh, it's going to be the plus. So definitely for children, it's also very good to learn with one of these graphical languages. Uh, I think. Yes, agree uh, one hundred percent. Are there other remarks or, or questions? Francis, do you have anything? Yeah. Okay. So first mm -hmm. of all, yeah, thanks for the your talk. It's it's very clear. Uh, so and my question is, can you talk a little bit more about the test cases that you like you this like you used for testing that your upgrade? Yeah. Um, so basically, what I did was. I couldn't, of course, I, I was also very afraid to test it on the actual 2D device. 
because if I would have made, for example, a conversion mistake between um, the number of turns of the motor um, to the linear movement, I mean, of course, if I would, if I would say that it moves one millimeter when actually the instruction sent to the motor is to move one meter, then it would crash directly. And these things can move very fast. And uh, well, it's uh, it was challenging, you know, because you cannot always be sure that what you write is going to be okay. Um, and actually, there was this conversion problem because what I had programmed in the first time was in millimeters, whereas the, or the real program uses meters. So when I then very carefully said, "Oh, move one millimeter now," it uh, went crazy and it went just meow inside. And luckily, there was uh, the person who was was um, was supervising me on this, who is actually responsible. Um, <laughs> he was standing there because we knew that this could happen, and just holding back the motor. Um, but uh, yes, this was uh, during the final test, even so. Then still things can go wrong. Um, before how I test it was first in the lab view environment. Well, uh, as as we saw, you have these. Uh, you can still see my screen, right? So you have you have these. Um, well, blocks, uh, not blocks, but front panels rather, for each function. So you can test each function separately as long as there's no hardware involved. So that's very nice. If there is hardware involved for the motors, I had to do 1D devices. So the two things that were standing on the table before, uh, on which I showed some details of the motor and the switches, um, which allowed me to, um, to test the motor movements uh, first, I was very basic. I just made some programs testing if I could well move these things with the new software because nobody ever tried it before with the new software in LabVIEW uh, using the new hardware. Just a very basic movement, totally not yet in the frame of of the of the 2D probe uh, manipulator. So not in this big uh, program with a huge uh, hierarchy, just separate programs, uh, which then well could later be used as as functions if necessary. Um, so that was the testing of, of this. Then later I uh, knew that this was working and then there's a big step where you cannot test. Then you just, um, well, you know that the code that you have, the basic level is working. You need to then look for, maybe let's go back to this. Then you need to look for functions and their equivalent functions and that you can also test because you know how the old system used to work. You know that this function, for example, does um, a move, no, maybe the, let's make something different. This function makes sure that everything stops if you hit the lowest switch because it is a limiting case. Then you need to look for the same, more or less the same function here. So maybe this one makes sure, sure that everything stops if you hit the lower uh, switch, uh, unless you have another function which overrides it, which also was the case, which is also annoying because then you need to be sure that you actually know that there can be an overwriting of this. Um, but then what you do is you make sure that you know this equivalence in advance, and then you can test these functions in programs that you write yourself, which mimic some basic behavior. But then when you implement them, when you actually change this to this, you need to change everything at once because you cannot test if there are two green cubes and two yellow cubes because there is not a single system which will be able to run this simultaneously. The yellow cubes are compatible with old hardware, the green with new hardware. So you need to change all the yellow cubes, all the old ones with all the new ones. And only then you can test. And um, of course, then you have the debugging mode, uh, which we also uh, discussed, which will well, guide you to where your uh, mistakes are. But then you, um, you well, you you have to wait for this moment, and then you can start debugging. But you cannot anticipate all mistakes. Um, for the data acquisition part, it was very similar. However, there there was an option to. To uh, test with what is called uh, what is called virtual probe. Well, basically virtual probes. So you would have um, virtual inputs uh, simulated 
um, because uh, the data acquisition is also supported by the same company that makes LabVIEW. And they uh, provide this option to pretend that you actually have an input when you don't, and then you can have a, just a sinusoidal input and you can see if it's processed in the right way. Um, and this was more or less equivalent, I would say, this, this level of testing was equivalent to the testing of the two 1D manipulators. So it also allows you to test the basic functionality of your new system on a lower level. For data acquisition, for example, it was very important that um, there is a synchronization of your different uh, inputs because, of course, you want this characteristic uh, plot the way it is and not with uh, some um, offset on one axis, which is not there on the other axis, which could change the shape of your curve. Uh, and also could uh, cause, for example, uh, a huge amount of extra storage because you would, if you would uh, start recording here at time zero and here at time one second later, you record in um, at a microhertz frequency, then that means you have a billion uh, data points for, uh, I think, six, uh, one example on the end, I think 16 channels. So you have 16, and then on the end, you have 16 million zeros on the other one. So that's a lot of. Of extra data that you you don't need, so synchronization is is they're also important. But then again, these are things that maybe you can only test uh, afterwards after you changed everything. Um, so you can do intermediate testing, but not in every step. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any more comments, questions? Uh, maybe I'll ask one. Will you be using this experience for your master thesis? Uh, will it be a related topic? Um, not really. Uh, my uh, master thesis will be on reflectometry. Uh, so, uh, well, diagnostics with, with, with waves uh, and not with, um, with electric, well, not, not with circuits like, like Langmuir probes. Um, I think uh, if we come to a stage where I can do testing uh, in the lab, because first it will be designed mainly for me, uh, if I come, however, to the stage where I, I can do testing in the lab, it would also be more, more basic testing, not um, in a real um, experimental environment like, like this, would more be um, testing of, of the antenna itself, in, um, of the component, not as an application. Um, however, I think that uh, experience of upgrading a system, not necessarily in lab view, but in general of upgrading a system was very uh, good for me. It um, definitely makes you look on a different way to every code that you write. You always try to make it more comprehensible. I know teachers always say it's very important, but most of the times you don't realize how important it is until you face, well, the consequences of uh, of when you didn't document it right or when you just made a bit of a mess and then two weeks later you need to change something about this assignment for example maybe sometimes you already notice it but when you have a project like this on which you're working i was working almost a, well a year is, is a lot but say eight months on uh, code which was written uh, 20 almost well almost 20 years before and then you realize that it's important to really document your stuff of good. These people, maybe when they were programming, didn't realize that this would ever be upgraded. Maybe they thought it was just an intermediate thing and there was going to be something uh, different coming their way. But um, still, it's, it's, it's very important to, to document everything right. Also, think that uh, the experience with LabVIEW was very nice because it's, uh, well, it's also something different and uh, it's, uh, it also makes you. Well, realize what I said before that that coding and programming is in the in the end about the essence is, is the algorithm and not the um, not the lines that you type. Um, so uh, I won't be using this uh, directly in the, in the following month, but uh, it's definitely something that I, is useful for me for uh, well maybe the following years. Yeah, definitely. It looks like great experience uh, that might be helpful in many different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, also, it was really great that I was off offered this opportunity in my first three years. 
I didn't have, well, I started in October, which was the same time as the classes started. So I didn't have any experience with fusion devices, with fusion once more. And, um, and I was introduced in this, and I could, well, uh, help in the lab. I was also assisting with some um, experiments on, on TJK um, while I worked there. Uh, so it was uh, really, really nice that it was also an opportunity. Any more comments, questions? Well, if no, I would like to thank you again for participating and thank you for your talk. And uh, I hope you will join us for the next talk, which will be on fast temperature fluctuations in high performance fusion plasmas by Chen from MIT. And this talk will be available on YouTube soon. Uh, and I hope we will get more comments and questions there. And uh, I wish you all to have a nice evening and thank you for coming. <laughs>